there is a general consensus out there that um, there were seven key works, masterworks, if you like, uh, produced by the Italian neorealist movement, which is a term that not everybody likes to use. And those seven films were produced by three filmmakers. Roberto Rossellini's Rome Open City in 45, Germany Year Zero in uh, 1947, and of course Paisa, and then Vittorio De Sica's three films, Shushine, Bicycle Thieves, and Umberto D, produced between 1946 and, and 1952, and then Lucino Visconti's La Terra Trema, The Earth Trembles, produced in 1947. Those seven films are the ones which have gained the most critical attention over the years and are united by certain stylistic tendencies which neorealism has become famous for. This is certainly the case with Bicycle Thieves, which to a great extent came to epitomize the technical, the stylistic tendency of Italian neorealism and its new approaches to storytelling. Among the most important stylistic characteristics, I would say, are a certain approach to visual representation. One thinks, for example, of this sense of bringing the camera to engage with reality to a great extent by rejecting filming in the studio and moving outdoors to film on location. And also, of course, dedication to telling the stories of ordinary people, by which I mean people of a lower class, or at least people who, if they were of a good class, are somehow in a situation of crisis and they are experiencing poverty, deprivation, and crisis. People who are living in conditions of oppression and, and, and of lack in this devotion to the masses and this sense of the need for social reform. Italian neorealism was one of those movements in which people thought that the medium could really contribute to society. Qui ci vuole un grosso programma di opere pubbliche e in fondo anche oggi al comizio che cosa hanno detto? La stessa cosa. Da noi non ve potete aspettare miracoli. Life as it is, that was Zavattini's favorite term, that this should be the objective of filmmaking, the capturing of life as it is. Italy had a long tradition of filmmaking, of course, going back to the earliest days of the medium. In the silent era, it had been one of the most important film-producing nations. One has to look back to Mussolini and what the fascist government did in the 1920s, but more especially in the 1930s in terms of investing in cinema. He invested in Italian fascist film clubs among Italian youth and fascist youth to foster cinema going. He invested money in Cinecittà, the foremost film studios in Italy, and indeed one of the most advanced filmmaking facilities in the world when it was opened in 1937. So film was always an integral part of the Italian popular culture. Of course, while the agenda for all of this for the fascists was to, I think, generate uh, a sense of a film culture which was compliant with fascism and which would serve fascist needs, it's one of the, the, one of the nice ironies that this was turned on its head uh, for very, very different political purposes and very, very ideological, uh, different artistic purposes after the war, um, which Mussolini did not anticipate at all. The question of when neorealism began is a very, very vexed one and continues to be hotly debated in Italy and abroad to this day. But in October 1941, Mario Alicata and Giuseppe De Santis, two of those who would become central to neorealism, had published an essay called Truth and Poetry in the influential journal Cinema, in which they argued for a return or a turn uh, in Italian cinema towards verismo, as they called it, which was a sense of truth to life. And they made the argument on behalf of their generation, if you like, that Italian cinema under fascism, although they didn't directly criticize the regime, as you might imagine, um, had become moribund, that was their term. It had become bourgeois, it had become staid, and that what was needed was a turn to a new realism, a new engagement with society, uh, and they took for inspiration the 19th century literature of Dickens, of Flaubert, of, and the, the plays of Chekhov and Ibsen, and they expressed admiration for the French poetic realists who'd been at the height of their powers in the 30s, that is Jean Renoir, René Clair, and others. And then, of course, they also expressed admiration for certain American filmmakers, people like King Vidor, for example, who are um, attuned to social crisis in films like Our Daily Bread and The Crowd in the late 20s and early 30s, but also the achievements of populist directors in the United States, such as William Wyler, Frank Capra, and then the documentarists, for example, of Pierre Lawrence, um, The Plough That Broke the Plains, and others based around the Depression.
the years from 1943 to 1945, when the political and social conditions of neorealism emerged, were very, very turbulent years. The country had been through 20 odd years of fascism. It had been through a number of years of occupation by German forces, the subsequent liberation by the Allies, which was a long and bloody struggle over two years. 300,000 people were dead as a result of the war. There were some estimates say 7% of the population living homeless. The economy was collapsed. And in this very, very volatile situation, you had bitterly opposed groups vying for control. The neorealist filmmakers um, engaged with this post-war crisis with a tremendously idealistic sense of what cinema might be able to achieve. Anything was possible. A complete reorganization of Italian society was possible, and this was a tremendously exciting possibility. I think that Rossellini, Visconti, De Sica, and others, De Santis, Sergio Amadei, um, all of these filmmakers and scriptwriters um, had a sense that cinema was a medium which was uniquely well placed to contribute to Italy's regeneration of its sense of self. And that was partly because it was thought by many to have a unique access to reality, that there was something uniquely symbiotic about the nature of the camera as a technology and the real world, and that if somehow one could bring those together in a pure and unmediated way, that the camera and the real world could achieve a spark, if you like, which would shed light on, on social issues. Making films in the immediate post-war era was a logistically difficult thing to do and a financially difficult thing to do, if not prohibitive. Um, one of the most striking things about the post-war period in Italy, in Italian film production, is the very low base from which the industry started in 1945. Only 27 feature films were made in Italy in 1945. And the rapid growth in production in the 10 years or so after the war to 1954-55, when there were approximately 200 films a year made. So the industry rebounded quickly. But in the immediate aftermath of the war, 45, 46, 47, there were no film studios in Italy, no properly operating commercial studios with equipment. And there was very little availability of funds for, for production. But in a sense, that maybe brought the filmmakers even closer to the subject matter that they were dealing with, because they were talking about subjects of deprivation, poverty, lack, ordinary people lacking bread, lacking housing, and they themselves were experiencing lack of basic necessities. And of course, the, you know, it has become legendary now, although it's partly true and partly mythical, that Roberto Rossellini, in making Rome Open City in 1944-45, was not simply able to go to his local distributor and buy, you know, a good stock of 35 millimeter film. He had to cobble together what he could from the black market, including putting together pieces that were intended really for still photography and so on and so on. And that led to the grainy, uneven effect of some of the, uh, the visuals in Rome Open City and the, the lighting qualities, etc. The war itself was and was not central as a subject for direct representation to neorealist filmmakers. What I mean by that is that in the immediate aftermath of the war, 45, 46, 47, as you might well imagine, with events of the occupation and liberation so fresh in their minds, uh, many neorealist filmmakers took as their first task the telling of that story, the brutality of the occupation, the illegitimacy of fascism and Nazism, and the heroic struggle of the people against it. Some of the greatest early neorealist uh, films, such as Rome Open City, were quite classical in the sense that they told a story and were very action-oriented. Rome Open City, the most, one of the most famous Italian neorealist films, is about the liberation of Rome. There are action sequences in it. There's a heroic narrative to it. It's about the liberation of a people um, by their own struggle. Subsequent to that, I think it's fair to say that relatively few neorealist films directly represent the war in the sense of the action of the war. This has partly to do with the turn on the part of Italian filmmakers towards the immediate needs of the people after the war and the effort to improve society and to bring about a solution to the problems rather than to continually represent the past. It also has to do with the move away from the heroic struggle against uh, fascism to this increasingly existential sense of the difficulties of being in the present moment. Things being for their own sake and often the difficulty of being the difficulty of interpersonal relationships, whether it's between 
uh, an individual and family or an individual and others in society about questions of responsibility because in one sense one, one can understand Bicycle Thieves as a film about existential responsibility, how one has a, a duty to one's family and about the different responsibilities between one which is torn. It's also a film about loneliness, uh, about isolation, about the variable hostility and warmth of the crowd or other people in, in the city. So these are films which are very much about individuals in crisis. So it becomes, if you like, an existentialist cinema. So their narratives are uneventful, but not in a negative way, in a way which is very positive and is central to their thematic and philosophical investigation. André Bazin, for example, was a tremendous champion of the film, the French film critic writing in Cahiers de Cinéma and elsewhere, admitted that there was nothing to the story. He said it wouldn't amount to two lines in a stray dog column in a newspaper. Nothing happens. A man gets a job, a very banal job, finds his bicycle stolen. If anything, we think he's a fool. And then he spends the rest of his narrative uh, traipsing around Italy on a completely fruitless journey in search of the most banal and humble object and never really getting anywhere. This was typical, I think, of the sense in which the Neorealists took action out of their films to a great extent and focused on people in predicaments and people often who were disempowered. And this is one of the key ways that one can think about the difference between Neorealism, say, and, and Hollywood cinema, which of course was, was prevalent and, and everywhere in Italy, I even when the Neorealists were working. It was the constant subtext against which they were working that Hollywood cinema prioritized uh, what we call action-oriented protagonists who were in charge of their own narratives, who were um, seeking goals whether it was crossing the frontier and uh, settling the West or resolving a mystery in the case of, of a detective film noir, for example. But that kind of action orientation was simply not there in neorealism. And they pared things down to, to the bare minimum, to the bare essentials. There was a strong hardcore of very noble, very idealistic filmmakers, uh, for example, Giuseppe De Santis, who were genuinely involved in bringing stories of the Italian working class and the exploitation of the Italian working class to audiences. But on the other hand, among these other filmmakers were more light-hearted filmmakers whose films, if you like, went in a different direction in achieving a balance or trying to achieve a balance between a neorealist visual aesthetic and um, stories which were not necessarily <laughs> miserable, for want of a better word, are stories which were not necessarily uh, bleak or existentialist, but which were more light-hearted. Uh, one thinks, for example, of Pietro Germi, some of whose films merged neorealism with elements of film noir, and they're quite action-oriented and, and dramatic in a, in a rather genre-based sense. But one thinks also, especially, I think, of Luigi Zampa in films like Vivere and Pace, To Live in Peace in 1946, which was criticized at the time by many on the left because it merged a neorealism realist visual style with what was essentially a light-hearted comedy. Certain Italian neorealist filmmakers had strong and lasting collaborative roles with certain writers. The closest and the most long-lasting of these relationships is certainly that between the director, Vittorio De Sica, and the writer, Cesare Zavattini, which lasted for over 20 years. While the role of the screenwriter was important, there was never anything very literary about Italian neorealist filmmaking or its origins. For the most part, Italian neorealist films uh, derived from screenplays or very, very, very loose adaptations of pre-existing works of literature. This is certainly the case with Bicycle Thieves, which um, in its most original form was an adaptation in a very loose sense of uh, a novel by Luigi Bartolini, published in 1946, uh, which had to do with an out-of-work painter who gains a job uh, posting bills, but which led to a very different uh, narrative uh, conclusion, which Zavattini borrowed and adapted. One of the ways that Italian neorealist filmmakers sought to bring reality closer to audiences was by overturning the star system, which had been traditionally central to Italian commercial filmmaking, as it was, of course, to Hollywood cinema, and which in Italian history was referred to under the term divismo, which was the, the term used to describe Italy's star system, particularly in the silent era when it was a major film producing nation. And one of the strategies which was employed by um, filmmakers, for example, by Rossellini in making Rome Open City, was to cast recognized stars 
who had a popular appeal, for example, Anna Magnani, and to cast them against type. Anna Magnani, who was known for her work in La Revista, in light-hearted theatre and reviews, was recast by Rossellini as the tragic heroine, Pina, which made the audience realize that they were not appreciating the star as a star, but if you like, appreciating the star for his or her ability to represent the common man or the common woman in the street. It was the case also, I think, with Visconti's casting of Massimo Girotti in Ossessione in 1943, and who had been previously known, for example, for playing a heroic Italian fighter pilot in Un Pilota Ritorna in 1942, so who was taken as a heroic Italian military man and recast as a thieving, adulterating murderer in Visconti's film. And then another tendency which went alongside it was the tendency not to use stars at all, not even to use trained performers, not to use actors, to use ordinary people plucked, if you like, from the street. This was the case with the casting of Lamberto Maggiorani in the role of Antonio and Enzo Staiola in the role of Bruno, the little boy, in Bicycle Thieves, whom De Sica cast because of their typical qualities, as well as their, as he saw it, their expressive qualities and their ability to elicit the emotion and the sympathy of the viewer. But not, of course, for any glamour that they had, not, of course, for any particular connotations that they carried. Te la mangeresti una pizza? De Sica liked to talk about the untrained actor as a blank canvas or as something that could be molded at will. And he spoke often about the satisfaction that he gained in a creative sense from working with non-actors because unlike professional actors, you would have to try and get a professional actor to forget who he was, to leave aside their stardom. These non-actors came to him with a ready-made humility, if you like, and no pretension whatsoever. And that spoke directly to the subject matter and to the thematic meaning he was trying to achieve. It was a working against stardom and a working against glamour, which was central to the neorealists' approach to performance. The stylistic characteristics of what we call neorealism are, I think, readily identifiable, though there's a lot of debate about just how many films really fit the bill. Um, but certainly uh, among the most important stylistic characteristics, I would say, are um, a certain approach to visual representation. The most appropriate subject for representation is the real world, often outside, outdoors, out of the studio, rather than any recreated world in studio, rather than any world of a luxurious mise-en-scene, rich settings, rich decor, rich costumes, things which for the most part are left by the wayside by the Italian neorealist in a very deliberate way. The setting of the city is central to an understanding of Italian neorealist filmmaking. One of the things that the neorealist filmmakers were able to capitalize on was the sheer social energy and excitement and density of the Italian city, which was like no other. Italian cities, if you think about it, especially being so ancient, are tremendously complex spaces, full of piazzas, narrow laneways, monumental structures, crumbling walls. So they're very, very uh, complex and rich environments, which, of course, makes them perfect for the camera, because they're so full of visual interest. But not only are they of interest physically in terms of their architecture and their structure, but they're socially rich. So these were very lived in spaces. So much life was lived outdoors in the Mediterranean climate. The interaction of families, of uh, businessmen, of street traders and others on the streets. One thinks of, in Bicycle Thieves, the Porta Portese market, the very famous flea market. One thinks of the huge crowds swarming out towards the end of the film from the football stadium at the end of a game the flow of life. And it's certainly the case that the neorealists, and none more so than De Sica, deliberately used ordinary, everyday locations which did not have any touristic meaning. They weren't recognizable from a picture postcard. One doesn't generally see the great 
architectural landmarks of Rome, be it the Colosseum or the great uh, you know, heroic arches built by the Romans. There was a deliberate effort to use humble locations. And this is certainly linked, I think, and there's an important link to make between neorealist visual style and fascist visual style in this sense that the fascist visual style of Mussolini and others had been all about championing Rome's great classical architecture, its statues of the various Caesars, that great ancient tradition. But that kind of iconography for the neorealists was entirely delegitimized because of its fascist associations. So there was a rejection of that kind of heroic mythology and landscape and a focusing on a much more banal but human setting. There were moments when the neorealists didn't simply take nature as they found it. Moments of Rome Open City are filmed in a makeshift studio that Rossellini established in, in central Rome in the Via degli Vignonesi, and indeed in Bicycle Thieves. Uh, one thinks of the famous scene in which Antonio and Bruno Ricci take refuge from a tremendous downpour when they're walking the, the streets of Rome. That scene is a scene which some of those who like to unpick the myths of neorealism often point to, because it's one scene in which the seeker didn't simply take nature as he found it, but actually enlisted the support of the Italian fire brigade and had firefighters come in and actually simply turn their hoses on the set and generate rain. And also, of course, hired a very large cast of extras to populate the streets and the piazzas. In fact, Bicycle Thieves was not a low-budget film. It was made on a budget of 100 million lire, which was a substantial amount of money uh, in 1948. And it was made with a sizable crew and in certain sequences involved the use of multiple cameras. In fact, uh, in some sequences, the use of six cameras running simultaneously, which was, in near realist terms, tremendously uh, extravagant um, filmmaking. So it was both typical and atypical at the time. The neorealist filmmakers, to a great extent, especially in the five years after the war, made a deliberate effort also to avoid contrivance as much as possible and artificiality in their images, partly by getting out of studios onto the street, but also partly by avoiding, for example, noticeably complex camera movements, crane shots, for example, or unnaturalistically long tracking shots, and tending as much as possible to allow the camera to fix on the object without great uh, manipulation. Along with which the neorealists turn to available light and deliberately shooting, uh, of course, very often for practical reasons, by day more than by night, but loving and trying as much as possible not to tamper with available light around various authentic neighborhoods in Rome with which he was familiar. The soundtrack and the visual track in a neorealist film do not always, in fact, very often do not at all, sit comfortably together. There was no synchronized sound, and so there is very often a disjuncture between the image that you see and the sound that you hear. It is the case that Mussolini imposed a system of dubbing on the Italian film industry, requiring, uh, partly for the purposes of official control, that all soundtracks, lines of dialogue, etc., be dubbed onto the film after the fact. And it continued after the post-war period, such that uh, Rossellini, De Sica, Visconti, and others uh, deliberately dubbed their films. And then there was also, of course, the tendency, and this was very deliberate, to avoid complex editing, by which I mean editing which was overt and noticeable to the viewer. Um, and I think particularly here must have been uh, the neorealists' knowledge of Soviet uh, filmmaking of the 20s uh, and 30s, the so-called montage school, in which editing had been central. And, um, you know, another left-wing tendency in filmmaking in which editing and jarring juxtaposition of images had been central to the aesthetic. The neorealists wanted to avoid editing uh, as much as possible and to allow the camera to run, to allow the camera to capture reality without cutting, without, if you like, cramping its style. 
Italian filmmakers who subsequently became known as neorealists gained a sense of themselves as being engaged in quite an interesting and distinctive project and beca became self-conscious, if you like, of themselves as neorealists, even if they didn't use that term, was, was very, very quick. It happened quickly, I think. Each film that was released became part of a very large public debate in which virtually everybody had something to say, and the major Communist Party newspapers, L'Unita, the Catholic Church, the Christian Democrats, each had their own film journal and commented on them and immediately responded to the film and appreciated its artistry or lack of and its political position, uh, conservative um, or, or radical. So it was inevitable, I think, in that climate that the filmmakers would gain a sense of themselves as self-consciously doing something new. And filmmakers were often prompted to put pen to paper or to make public statements to the press. And in that sense, neorealism generated an intellectual meat. So there was, if you like, a written discourse uh, behind this. And it's, it's not surprising in the sense that Italy is one of those countries which historically has been very privileged in that it's, there has been a toing and froing between its filmmaking culture and debate. And there's always been a healthy and hearty debate about film. Italian neorealist films fared well and badly in the Italian film market. Some films achieved both critical and commercial success. Of course, the most famous and one of the earliest is Rome Open City, released in 1945, which is one of the only, if not the only, Italian neorealist film to have been number one at the Italian box office in the year of its release, 1945-46. Few other Italian neorealist films achieved that kind of instant and universal popularity. Bicycle Thieves was made in 1948 and released in 1948-49, that particular season. Um, it was 11th most popular film of the year. It's important, of course, also to recognize that internationally, they were widely acclaimed. And I think the two countries in which they gained the most recognition and which then in turn became decisive in building the legend of neorealism were firstly France and secondly the United States. And it was French critics such as André Bazin uh, in Cahiers du Cinéma and French filmgoers which uh, reacted and applauded the neorealist achievements. And then, of course, American uh, critics in, in the New York Times, one thinks of the rave review given to Rome Open City by Bosley Crowther in 1946 when the film was released. And then, of course, of the Academy Awards, as we call them now, Academy Awards for Best Foreign Film, um, which were achieved by Shoeshine and then by Bicycle Thieves in subsequent years. So the international recognition and the ability of neorealism to travel internationally is a distinctive feature of the movement. And one of the ways of explaining it, surely, I think, is that there was something distinctive about audiences in Italy and internationally after the war. The war was something which, for better or worse, everybody has experienced. The French, the Italians, the British, the Americans. It was a unifying experience, if you like, but of course in, in a very terrible way. But it explains the very distinctive ability, I think, of neorealism to shoot like lightning uh, internationally uh, from one country to another and to gain uh, admiration in, in all contexts. Bicycle Thieves came out in 1948, almost, if you like, at the high point of neorealism, but also the last great moment in which neorealist filmmakers could breathe freely, if they could at all, in Italian political life. In 1948, there was a turnaround in which the Christian Democrats suddenly had the power. So there was, in this period, uh, a switch from a left-wing government to a right-wing government. And the neorealists became increasingly hostile to the conservative Christian Democratic Party, which launched often bitter, vitriolic, and very personalized attacks on filmmakers, especially when things of the quite vociferous exchanges between Andriotti, the Italian uh, Minister for Culture and, and eventually um, Prime Minister, who took very strong condemnatory public stances in papers and in, 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 um, in various other fora against neorealism personally castigated Vittorio De Sica for letting his nation down and called upon De Sica to exercise his social responsibility, which Andriotti was convinced had to do with telling ennobling and uplifting stories about Italy rather than bitter social portraits. As the time went on, and as neorealism became more and more bitterly fought over, 
a law was passed which made it uh, compulsory for all filmmakers seeking production funds from the government to submit their scripts in advance for government approval, which of course was a, a difficult thing to do if you wanted to make a contentious film of any kind. It's also the case that the problem for the neorealists was not only that they were coming under attack from the powers that be, but also that the commercial cinema was rebounding. Hollywood very quickly, throughout the post-war period, controlled between two-thirds and three-quarters of the box office at any given time. Cinecitta was reopened, re-equipped, refinanced, relaunched, and very quickly, studio-based escapist films were increasingly being produced in Italy and were increasingly outnumbering the rather numerically meagre efforts of the neorealists. Of the approximately 800 feature films which were produced in Italy in the 10 years or so after the war, um, the most generous estimates, using a flexible definition of what neorealism was, suggest that about a third, maybe 250, maybe 300 films, um, were neorealist. The atmosphere for the Italian neorealist filmmakers deteriorated rapidly followed then by controversy after controversy around particular films, for example, Miracle in Milan, and then with Umberto Di in 51-52. And it's at this time that many point to the demise of neorealism and its replacement by something else. Now, there are a number of films in and around the period 1952, 53, 54, uh, which became particularly controversial even among filmmakers themselves and those who championed neorealism, because one person pointed to it as the end of neorealism, another pointed to it as yet another creative reemergence of neorealism. As these filmmakers, Rossellini and De Sica, but then also newcomers, so to speak, such as uh, Fellini and Antonioni, moved towards more and more metaphysical issues, the left began to criticize quite strongly the rejection, as they saw it, of social issues and began to accuse these filmmakers of retreating to relatively comfortable milieu and subject matter, especially middle-class subject matter. Two of the most important of these are Roberto Rossellini's uh, voyage to Italy and Federico Fellini's uh, somewhat later uh, film, Knights of Cabiria of 1957. In Roberto Rossellini's uh, Voyage to Italy of 1954, starring George Sanders and Ingrid Bergman, you have a film which focuses on a very well-to-do middle-class English couple travelling to Naples uh, in order to sort out the estate of uh, George Sanders' relative who has died. And this is a film which engages with the streets of Naples, it engages with the landscape, but one which is not at all austere and which in many ways is pretty beautiful in a way which is not neorealist, at least if one uses the sense of the term a la bicycle thieves, which for some, especially on the left, immediately meant that it could not be neorealist, because neorealist films must have to do with the working class, and if they did not, they could not be neorealist. But André Bazin, the French film critic, was one of those who argued that the film and Rossellini's great achievement and Rossellini's courage was to push the boundaries of neorealism and to adapt neorealism to the changing circumstances in which Italians and others found themselves in the mid-1950s. Because, of course, by the mid-1950s, the Italian economy is starting to stabilize. In fact, by the end of the 50s, there's something of an economic boom. It's not enough simply to talk about the war anymore or the immediate effects of the war, but that one must talk about uh, how Italians are living their lives now and how they're having to deal with often an increasingly affluent uh, environment, which is no longer revolutionary or potentially revolutionary, but in which there's a status quo, if you like. And this, in a different way, is, is, is also arguably the case with um, Federico Fellini slightly later, Knights of Cabiria, which for Bazin uh, is one of the last moments of neorealism, but also one which transforms neorealism, because it's a film which is about a poor prostitute living on the outskirts of Rome and who plies her trade on the streets of Rome, and in that sense the film is a social study, but uh, it's not necessarily a film which is particularly interested in her exploitation. Its critics, or the film's critics, alleged that she was happy and unwitting in her poverty, if you like, and of course, being a Fellini film, it's a film which involves much comedy. It's a film which also moves away from neorealism because it's at least as much about 
swanky clubs and fashion culture, which became increasingly important uh, in the 1950s, as it is about the harshness of life on the street for the poor and the dispossessed. And in that sense, Fellini is one of those who many point to as having moved neorealism the furthest away and the most decisively away from that um, sense of gritty life on the streets to something more magical, to something uh, not, which is not only realist, although it is realist, but which is also playing with the medium of cinema and playing with the device of the camera in a way which acknowledges that what you're watching is artificial. Many historians argue that for all intents and purposes, neorealism as a coherent thing and neorealism as a certain ethical or political disposition dissolved and gave way to something else, which one generally refers to as the, the art cinema of the 60s epitomized, I guess, for many historians by films like La Dolce Vita by Fellini in 1960. The influence of neorealism on subsequent filmmaking, both in Italy and abroad, is very, very difficult to overstate. Uh, I would suggest that it was certainly um, one of the most, if not the most, um, long-lasting and internationally pervasive um, film movements, of all of the film movements of the 20th century, of all of the avant-garde in cinema of, of that era. One can point to, for example, the distinct parallels and sometimes the echoes in American film noir of the late 40s and early 50s, especially in the representation of urban landscapes as dilapidated and as run down and as poor. But the influence goes uh, further afield too. In the 1960s, neorealist filmmaking became a key point of inspiration, I think, because of its visual commitment to everyday life, because of its visual commitment or its ideological commitment to the people, among third world filmmakers, such as the work of Satyajit Ray, again documenting the harsh conditions faced by the peasantry in uh, recently liberated and independent India in, in the 1950s. So third worldist filmmakers were one of the key uh, groups to pick up on the neorealist tradition. But it was also, I think, uh, innovative and influential in other types of filmmaking, especially in documentary. The closest to documentary filmmaking within the Italian neorealist tradition, which was, of course, a fiction-based uh, filmmaking tradition, was the tendency epitomized by Zavattini. And Zavattini certainly was influential upon those filmmakers who worked in cinema verité, for example, Jean Rouch in La Périmie du Maine in the early 60s, or the American filmmaker Robert Drew with uh, so-called direct cinema documentaries of the 1960s, uh, such as Primary, uh, and then, of course, into other direct cinema films like Don't Look Back and, uh, and so on. So the influence was, was, was felt far and wide for many generations. What is particularly valuable about neorealism is its realism. It's the freshness and the striking engagement on a very humble and, I think, well-meaning level uh, and in an idealistic sense uh, between the camera and reality, between the filmmaker and reality, uh, between the filmmaker and an audience, which is not always um, easy to conjure with and which is not always evident in the very media-saturated, very cynical, um, savvy uh, world of images in which we live today in which it seems that there's a constant appetite for, among audiences for a sense of reality. But I think seeking it in a, in a very different way, or at least being provided it in a very different way to that which the neorealists achieved. And I would argue that one of the constantly inspiring things about neorealist films is that one can always go back to them as a way of cutting through the morass of very often cynical and very often exploited media images, which everybody has to deal with today, because they cut straight to the issues and they cut straight to the image. And it's their sometimes naive, but very endearing directness and honesty, which is their constant redeeming feature.